Now listen, um, uh, well, if you've had just, if you're, truly, if you've had so, just so much, you're not sure where to start, That that's kind of how I feel tonight. Um, and I'm going to be reading quite a bit, and, and that's okay. We, we can get through this. I'm, I, I, I do preach. I, I, I more preach than teach. I try really hard to teach, but just sometimes it just kind of get carried away, I guess. But uh, I do have a message here for us. I think this is a message for every Christian on the planet Earth tonight here. I really do. And um, Samantha started this um, thing about praying for the soldiers, the love letters for the soldiers. What, in August or so? July, August or so? And we started doing that. And when that came up, that was along about the time when there were so many things going on in the nation. Uh, policemen were getting shot. Other people were getting shot in the streets. It just seemed division had just risen its ugly head in the midst of our nation like, like it hasn't in, in a long time. And all of that just started turning her, her idea of the letters of love to the soldiers just started going over in my spirit. And all of a sudden, I think ever since that time, I have felt an urgency over this country. We had that going on. We have the elections going on. Um, oh my goodness, the, the, the military pulling people out, possibly, and, and I, listen, I am not here tonight to be political, okay? But I am here tonight to show you a story in the Word that was very political, and it saved an entire nation. And I think that if anybody is in that place right now, the United States of America is in that place. And I have just had such an urgency, almost like telling people, get on your faces before God. We've Amen. got to pray. Amen. It's going to take prayer to ever, ever straighten this out. It's going to take the hearts of God's people to ever bring any sanity back to where we need it to be. The other day I called Sue Thomas. Her name came up and that she had called about a glow and I called her. <laughs> I've never met Sue, but just on that conversation, I just almost got into just almost preaching with her. We gotta pray. We gotta pray. We gotta pray. And, and when we're done, what I want to do, I know a glow is, is very big about holding hands in the circle and everybody praying. I, I don't want to do that tonight. I want people in the altar or at your seats on your face, on your knees, or just sitting at your seats and to be in prayer. And I want us to end tonight like that, okay? And just get it in our hearts. I want you to come before you leave. Take a flag. Take it home with you. Put it up on your refrigerator. And every time you walk by, just plead the blood over this nation, over the United States of America. That's where we are right now. That's where we are. And I want to show you where some other people got to, okay? And it all came about because somebody in generations before them did not obey God, okay? But we're here tonight, and we're going to rise up, and we're going to be who God called us to be, and we are going to be the prayers that he's called us to be. God needs your voice. He needs your mouth planting and sowing his word into the earth so it can come to pass. People want to just sit back passively and they say, hey, God can put in whoever he wants to. No, that's not how he works. The way mighty God works, we can find it over in Isaiah 9 and 6. And it says, for unto you a son is born. Unto you a child shall be born. And the government will be upon his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. He's a Prince of Peace. Now I want you to go back to the first of that verse. Now we know as the body of Christ, He's the head, right? Mm -hmm. He's the head. We're the body. Mm -hmm. The government will be upon His shoulders. Where are the shoulders? In the, body. in the body. They're in the body. So who makes that determination in this earth? The body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And we do it by obeying our headship. We do it by obeying and hearing from God and letting Him lead us in the earth. And then the body goes forth and goes forward doing His righteous cause in the earth. 
And we do it by speaking his word, knowing his word, speaking his word, declaring his word to be so in this earth. Amen? Amen. 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 Yes. Can, we, can we all agree with that? Yes. That's where yes. I'm going tonight, okay? All right, here we go. <clears throat> For such a time as this, January 1st, I spoke of what I felt was one of the most important things I'd ever been given by the Holy Spirit at that time. And it was very simply this, taking the limits off of God. Just take the limits off. Just let him be God. Just believe and act like that the Bible is really true. Right. That's, right. That's all you got to do. Did he really say that? Yep, he said it. So just believe it. Not only believe it, but then you act on it. You speak it and you begin to act on it. You act like it's true. I know during the time in March of uh, the March of this year, there were three people in this room, mm -hmm. and when we did a complete service, we even took an offering. <laughs> <laughs> I even took up a dollar. But we did that, and we didn't talk to three people in this room. Right. We talked to the seventy-five who's coming. Now look who's here tonight, mm -hmm. and we had a good crowd last night. So we speak and we decree and we call forth the things that we want. Faith is calling forth the yes. things that we want. Yes, it's it just is. acting like God's word is true. Yes, is. Okay? Come on. Now we've done that. And we've watched our lighthouse go from three people to 18 last month. And just look what we have now. Look what the Lord has done. Amen. But I feel tonight that this message is probably the most important thing I've ever had the opportunity to speak about. At this point anyway. I really do. I feel I feel it's that important. When y'all walk out these doors, you may not. You may think, well, you know, I don't know. You know, you may think that. I don't know. But for my heart and for my life, it is that important. Um, I felt fairly quiet about it on Facebook and stuff like that uh, because I didn't want to, uh, you know, cause cause any kind of commotion, any kind of problem. Uh, number one, the other preacher's being kind of quiet about it. Number two, I represent Glow, so I have to be careful what I say and do. And two, I sell real estate. I want your business. <laughs> <laughs> that might not be a word. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I tell you, I don't want to offend anybody. But you know what? I repented about that. I mean, I am who I am. This is what I am. I do love the Lord. And usually by the time I get through with those customers, they're praying over that house themselves. <laughs> I say, is this the one you want? They say, yes. We pray from corner to corner to corner to corner. We bring that house in. That's the way I do my business. Now, I don't know what Remax would think about that, but then the folks get along just fine. So anyway, <laughs> that's the truth. It's the truth. But, but y'all, he's given us a voice to use, and shame on us if we don't use it. You hit that just a minute ago. When you go out of here, you call those things forth, and you bring it in. If we do that, the power of life and death is in our tongues. We call in what we want in the life, in our lives. And I know, I, we all know these things I'm going to be speaking here tonight, probably. We're just going to recap on, on them and just get refreshed in them, okay? Can we do that? I believe every single one in this house, in this room, has been called for such a time as this. I think there is a door that God wants you and needs you to open to impact your family, your friends, and your church. Our nation, our world is in trouble. Anybody, can, anybody questioning that here tonight? There are things done in darkness uh, that's been harmful to our nation. There's been an attack on uh, sweet little babies in a way like we've never heard before. Uh, and on marriage. Um, and you know what? If we say anything about it as Christians, uh, we're, we're called certain names. And they do all this, of course, in the name of love. They'll do it in the name of love. Right in the face of God and in the name of love. And I, and the, I guess they believe that. But their minds are blinded. We need to pray for them. And now Jesus loved, and he loves. He loves now. But he never did get into agreement with evil. No. Not one time did he get into agreement with evil. The woman who was caught doing things she wasn't supposed to be doing, he loved her. Oh my gosh, he saved her life right there. He loved her. And he said, let's don't do that anymore. But he never did get into agreement with her sin. And God will not do that. He won't get into agreement with your sin. He'll love you and we can love them. But he won't get into agreement with our sin. And I want to tell you, there's a big difference in being carnal 
Sometimes we can live a carnal life. We can do things in the natural and in the flesh and a carnal life. That's totally different, though, from just being plain demonic. Mm -hmm. And you know when people are making choices and decisions in their lives that are just demonic. Mm -hmm. You know when people now, that, that person shouldn't have done that, and I know that. But that person's got a good heart, and you know it. They're doing the best they can. They're growing in their, their walk with God, possibly. But then you also know some people who just are flat demonic. They do stuff. They have no intention of following God, and they're going to do everything they can to keep you from doing it. Mm -hmm. So there's a big difference in being carnal and being demonic. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you about a vision that was given by a lady named Lynn Hammond. Lynn Hammond and her husband, Mac Hammond, they are pastors at Living Word Church Christian Center over in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And this is what Lynn said. And I think this is one thing that set a fire under me. This is what she said. She said I, in her, she was having a dream. It was either a night vision or a dream. She couldn't decide which one that was going on. She said, I, I believe I was awake. And uh, she said, but she saw herself flying over the Hudson River. And she saw the Statue of Liberty. And that Statue of Liberty represents the gateway of freedom and liberty. She saw the crown, which symbolizes authority to lead and command. And she saw the torch, which symbolizes liberty and freedom. The freedom enlightened the world to the gospel. And then she even saw the broken chain that is on the foot of the, the Statue of Liberty. And now the statue doesn't point toward the city. It points out to the, toward the harbor. And what it does, it welcomes in the people, the immigrants coming into that harbor. And that broken chain around her foot represents them being broken from whatever had them in bondage. And they're immigrating into our country. We have always been open to anybody who needed to come to the freedom and liberty that we have to offer always. But in her vision, what she saw over the head of this Statue of Liberty she saw a skeleton, and she said this skeleton was like a wispy cloud, it was, and it was, it was in the shape of a skeleton. And she said the skeleton had on a black headscarf on her head like a Middle Eastern woman. Now the skeleton was blowing smoke toward the Statue of Liberty, and every time the skeleton moved toward that statue, the statue would start to reel and, 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 and kind of fall back and forth. And she said she, she wasn't sure if the statue was going to remain standing. And she said she looked and she saw a hand, and it was a, a mean, ugly, fierce hand. It was a dangerous hand. And it became very large, enlarged. And it looked like a threat to the entire world. And she said that hand was wrestling with the Statue of Liberty, trying to get the torch away from her, the torch of freedom that enlightens the world and was trying to replace that torch uh, with a cup, and that cup represented a cup of judgment. Now she said through this silver cup there was a sword, and the symbol on that sword had the crescent and the star. Now let me stop right here. As the GLOW International, we have three mandates, and that is to reconcile the man and the woman, that is to pray for the Jewish nation, and that is to get the gospel out to the Muslim people. We are not against the Muslim people, not in any shape, fashion, or form. But what this woman saw was the threat of the Islamic um, the, um, extremism toward our nation is what she saw in this dream. And what this, what this, uh, this skeleton's hand was trying to do was to replace that torch of freedom with this cup of judgment over this nation. And the sword of judgment was trying to replace the freedom that we all know in America, um, that we all know as Americans, and he was trying to replace it with every kind of ism that you could find. What are we called if we go against um, somebody trying to get into our country that, 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 that we don't feel like they, they should? Um, what is that? Xenophobia. Those are all kinds of phobias and stuff. I'm not even going to go there. I, I, I don't care. I don't care. That, that's, what, that's what this was trying to do to the Statue of Liberty. Now the Statue of Liberty was just reeling back and forth. And Lynn said, Pastor Lynn said, then she heard a sound. 
And she said when she heard that sound, it was the sound of bees buzzing. Just buzzing, buzzing, buzzing. And she said as she got closer to hearing that sound, that that buzzing sound, it was people praying. And she said not only were they praying, but they were literally undergirding the freedom that the statue stood for. They were undergirding the Statue of Liberty with the authority and with the power. And they were literally commanding those demons to leave this country. She said then she heard there were angels. That she could see angels and they were at work. And they were helping and assisting the prayers pray. And then the, pr the prayers would then shout with a loud voice. And the angels would answer them. And this is what the angels said. They said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Amen. When the righteous rule, the people rejoice. Amen. Yes. Now, that's what those angels were yes. coming to do to yes. assist those prayers. Mm -hmm. You do know the angels are sent here to minister to us, Amen. the heirs of salvation, right? Amen. And as these people were praying and undergirding that statue in such a way, here comes the angels. They're speaking the word of God. They hearken to the word of God. And they do everything that the word tells them to do. Praise God forevermore. That's powerful to me. And they said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. Now when the prayers would pray, and when they would shout out those words, the skeleton would move away. And the hand that was trying to grab hold of that torch and replace it with the cup would loosen and fall back. And that's how powerful these prayers were. Now spiritually, she felt that this was a warning from the Lord. And he was expecting us as prayers to come against this by the power of the blood of Jesus mm -hmm. and to command it that it could not take hold of us here in America. Amen. They cannot have this country. Amen. We will stand and defend our country yes. as prayers, as Christians, as blood-bought believers. Amen. We are a great army that God has called to rise up for this righteous cause at this time. We were truly born for such a time as this. Amen. Each one of us have a prayer to pray. Each one of us have a, have a word to speak. That's what he's called us here for. We can look out there and it may look scary, but if it does, oh my God, just remember this. Just when I pray, the angels will assist me. When I pray and I speak God's word, and, she, and what she did, she called her church into this prayer assignment to where that, um, that um, force could not take hold over this nation. That had, a, that, that had a huge yeah. impact on me. Well, you played that video right there. I want y'all to know what happened back in September. And it is September 19th, 2016. I'm standing in New York City, in City Hall Park, on a rainy Monday afternoon, a little past one. And what you see in back of me, about to be unveiled, covered up, is the arch that led to the Temple of Baal. In a moment, they're gonna have a ceremony, they're gonna unveil it, and there'll be American leaders here, and what you will see on American soil is the sign of Baal. rabbi, a messianic Jew and he wrote the book called The Harbingers mm -hmm. and he wrote this based on things that happened on 9-11 mm -hmm. and his voice has risen up over this nation. Yes. They have had him in the capital praying and, 
And th this is what is trying to take hold. I am here to declare it will not be. It will not be. Who did that? Who did that gate or was sponsored it? Yeah, who sponsored that gate? Uh, I don't know. I can send you the link wow. to the video. I only wanted to show you the unveiling. Wow. The video is about five, six, seven minutes long, so it's a little bit long, but I will see anybody who wants it, let me know, and I'll send you the entire clip, okay? Yes. Because he has a, a that we started at three minutes and 30 seconds into this. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that's what's trying to take. Now, we need God's hand to intervene into this country like never before in its history. This is one of the most important elections we'll ever see, mainly because of the Supreme Court judges, the highest court in our land. We need godly pe people in those positions. Mm -hmm. I want to go back into the Word, and let's take a look at the psalmist that was given to a young woman named Esther and her cousin Mordecai. This book doesn't even mention the word God, yet God's overruling presence is seen throughout the entire story. Mm -hmm. The Jews hold this as one of their most important books in the Bible. It's a beautiful story of God's preservation of his people. The king Osiris, he was ruler of the Persian Empire, ruled over 127 um, uh, nations. His wife Vashti, they were having a feast. I'm just, I'm just going to hit high points as to what happened in this story, and then I'm, I'm going to give you what, what God gave me in it, okay? Vashti refused to come to the party, made everybody mad, made a fool out of the king. So we know that um, he, he removed her as his queen. Enter Hadassah, or Esther, who was a Jewish woman. Her cousin Mordecai was a Benjamite of the same family of Saul, King Saul. Mordecai had raised Esther as his own daughter. She was very beautiful. These two people were actually royalty. You think about that. Mm -hmm. they, they were of royal blood from the house of Saul. Mm -hmm. This story to me was as much about Mordecai as it was Esther because he introduced and originated every plan. <laughs> when you read this story, you'll find that he is the direct cause of everything that happened. Mm -hmm. He really represented the Holy Ghost. He was the one sitting outside the king's gate he saw everything that went down. He heard everything. You know, the, the Holy Ghost is always how many steps ahead of us. Brother Mark Hankins says he's a genius, and if you'll hang out with him, you look kind of smart. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what Mordecai did. Now, when the king's decree came out to replace Queen Vashti and was announced, Mordecai brought Esther to the palace. Esther found favor in the sight of everybody she met. She went through her pur pur uh, purification period of one year. And then afterwards, she appeared before the king. The king loved Esther above all women. He chose her to be his queen uh, and he made a great feast. Now, Mordecai sat daily outside the gate, and he heard some things. He heard about a plot to kill the king. And so he got that information to Esther, and he said, go tell the king. There's two men, two, two of his chamberlains, trying to kill him. So he got that information to the king, saved his life. After this happened, then, the king pointed a man named Haman. And he set his seal above every prince. Now, everybody was supposed to bow to Haman. And we know that we had one man sitting outside the gate of that uh, palace that wasn't going to bow to anybody but his own God. And he refused to bow to Haman. Mm -hmm. And this made Haman mad enough that he wanted to not only destroy him, but the entire Jewish nation. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go back here a little bit. Haman's heritage. He was an Agagite. He was of the nation of the Amalekites. Who always tormented and terrorized the Jewish nation. It was the Amalekites. Now let's go to 1 Samuel 15. I'm going to read this to you real quick. Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people of Israel. And now listen and pay close attention to the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of the host, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way when, he came, when Israel came up from Egypt. Now I want you, Saul, to go and strike Amalek and completely destroy everything they have. Do not spare them. Kill both man, woman, child, infant, ox, sheep, camel, donkey. Everything was to be destroyed. Well, guess what? He didn't do it. Saul didn't do it, did he? No. He brought back the animals to present as a sacrifice unto God. And Saul told him, he said, you know it's better to obey that sacrifice. And you know disobedience is as a sin, and rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Mm -hmm. And you knew better than that, Saul. And God totally, totally removed his spirit and his anointing from King Saul. We know that, don't we? Now look, that happened 600 years before this. 
Now we have another Amalekite, another Agagite named Haman, Haman, who's decided not only to kill one Jew, he's going to kill all of them. And take this, the ones that made him so mad and caused it to happen were raised up from the house of Saul. So we have royalty over here, and then we have the Amalekites over here, and here we go again. Now, had Saul done what he was called to do 600 years ago, Haman wouldn't be here to tell the story. There's a story. Y'all know Daniel in the lion's den? Y'all know that story? Okay. And you know that, that the people tricked the king and, and talked, him in, talked the king into throwing Daniel into the lion's den? That king loved Daniel. He didn't want to throw him into the lion's den, but he'd been tricked by his own people. Evil things being done in the darkness of a nation can change the course of a nation. We know that. We're living it right now. Anyway, king couldn't sleep all night long. He's worried to pieces about Daniel. He loved his friend. He gets up the next morning. He looks down there in the lion's den. Oh, Daniel, surely to goodness your God took care of you. And Daniel says, have no problem. Have no worries, O king. I am just fine. Daniel probably slept better than the king did. We know that. He probably did. Now, when the king found out what happened, what did he do? He had all of those men who tricked him, their wives and their children, thrown into that den, didn't he? He had them killed. Didn't they throw them into the den? Yeah. Yeah. Now, my mother used to read that story and cry. Poor old mama just could not understand why those little kids ended up like that. She said, Sheila, why did he do that? Why would God do that? Why in the world would he do that? Yeah, I can understand these mean men being killed. I can understand that. But the wives and the kids, why would God do that? I said, Mama, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, about three months ago, I was sitting in my kitchen. The TV was on. And they were uh, interviewing Osama bin Laden's son. He was grown now. And he's coming after the West. And right then, at that moment, I thought, Mama, this is why the king had them all destroyed. Mm -hmm. It's all in the bloodline. Mm -hmm. Now, when they got Osama bin Laden, they should have got the rest of them. <laughs> you know, sometimes when you cut the head off of a snake, the body still wiggles. <laughs> His body was still wiggling. <laughs> and he says he's coming after us. <laughs> I don't know. Nobody, I've never heard anybody teach this. That is my own personal revelation. So y'all take that for what it's worth. But I think that's what happened. I think that's why. And it makes God look like a very mean God. But he's not. He's not a mean God. He's trying to protect his people. And you cannot make deals with the devil. You can't dance with him. You can't reason with him. He doesn't want to reason with you. He wants to kill you if he can. His job, Jesus exposed him. I can see the headlines in the new newspaper. Satan exposed. The enemy exposed. He steals, he kills, and he destroys. He's a thief. And his name is Satan. Yeah, you want to know what's going on in your life? Brother Charles Capps used to always say, he used to always say, the dividing line of the Bible is John 10.10. 10. You can take your life and divide it by that one verse right there. Jesus is talking. The thief comes but for to seal, kill, and destroy. That's right. But I come that you have life. Amen. Overflowing, more abundant life. Amen. So whatever's going on in your life, is it stealing from you? Is it destroying you? Is it hurting you? Or is it giving you wonderful, overflowing Amen. life? You can tell where that's coming from. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think that anything that happens in their lives is from God. No. no. There is a devil out with an assignment against your life. And it's up to you to know the difference. Let me ask you something. If you went home tonight, you went in your living room, and there's this big old hog in your living room. <laughs> and he just tore up Jack. Filthy. <laughs> Snibbling hog. <laughs> he done slobbered over everything you had, just tore your place up. Now, there's a note on Bill Mirror Big TV that says, This is God's will for you. What would you do? 
to go to bed, to sit down with pig, to sit down with that hog? No. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. You'd go to your kitchen, you'd get the biggest, blackest, heaviest darn skillet you had, and you'd get that hog out of your living room, wouldn't you? You'd want him out. But see, Satan wants to deceive us like that. So what we do, <laughs> Brother Callie told that story, I know, 20 years ago. I'll never forget it. I will never forget it. But we just, um, we just need to look and see where are these things coming from. Lord, Holy Ghost, show me how I need to pray in this. And that's what we do. But anyway, let's get back to our story now. Okay. Haman was an Amalekite. Um... He was from one of those men that Saul refused to kill, and now here we are, six hundred later, six hundred years later, and and he is now going to be trying to kill all the entire Jewish nation. Okay, so it seems like God may be cruel in His demand, but the Amalekites were always a threat to God's people because God knows what lies in the future. And now there is, uh, hey, I've already done all this. I'm, I've done, done all the way down. I've done told y'all about all this, some about lying and everything else. But anyway, see, we didn't take care of the whole problem. They, they got Osama bin Laden, but now the sun's here, and uh, now we got ISIS too, so okay, we'll, put, we'll move forward. So here we are, 600 years down the road, and there's Haman. I've already done that too. Um, now, Haman. You're preaching good. Well, <laughs> kind of getting ahead of myself here. I know more about my message than I thought I did. <laughs> now, Haman, in, in his plot to, to kill the Jews, I, I just kind of want to hit these high spots, okay? Um, he, he went to the king, and he said, he said, Oh, king, he said, There's a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in the provinces of your kingdom. And now their laws are different from yours, and uh, they don't even observe your laws. Therefore, it is not the king's interest to to tolerate them and let them stay here. We just need to take care of this. Then he bribed the king with about $19 million, and the king bought into to Haman's story. Uh, he said, okay, Haman, go. Do whatever you need to do. Well, unknowingly, he had just uh, he had just sold his own queen's people into uh, into judgment there. He, did, he didn't realize that. Mordecai got this word to Esther as fast as he possibly could. He even sent her a copy of the, the decree that the king had talked about, and he told Esther, he said, now Esther, you need to go to the king and you need to let him know what's going on out here. But Esther hadn't been in there with the king in a while. And she said, you know, he, hadn't had, he has not asked me in. And I just really don't know if I should do that. That could mean certain death for me. Mm -hmm. So Mordecai then sent her this message. Now, Esther, <laughs> this, this is my paraphrase now. He said, now if you all together hold your peace at this time, there will be an enlargement and a deliverance to rise to the Jewish people, whether you go in there or not. And don't think you're going to get by with it, because you're a Jew too. And you and your house, your father's house, will fall. This threat is not just to all of us. It's to you too. Now, if you don't do this, God's going to raise somebody else who will. God's going to save his people. Hey, hallelujah. Amen. I'm one of those. Amen. How about y'all? I am one of those people. Yes. God's got a place for me, a place of safety for me. That's right. Hallelujah. And don't think you're going to escape the king's edict just because you're in his house. Uh, you're, you're going to be in this with us. And then he said this, for who knows, Esther, whether or not you came into this whole kingdom for such a time as this. When you got a call on your life, I don't care how long you run from it. I don't care how long you run from it. What you need to do is stand up and own it. And the sooner you do it, the better it is going to be for you. You accept that call. I don't care what it is. Because wherever you're called and whatever you're called to do, do you know the anointing is already there waiting for you? It's not that you're all so anointed. It's the position. Amen. And the minute you walk into that position, there you are. And everything you touch will prosper. Deuteronomy 28. Everything you set your hands to do will prosper. 
And it will be so easy. You know why? Because it's him doing it through you. It's him. And you have walked into your anointed place. And that's what Esther did. She was in her anointed place. And Mordecai knew that. Mordecai done figured all this out, I do believe. God is giving every one of us the opportunity to be an instrument to save the people. And if you fail to take up the righteous cause that God has called for you to do, he's just going to bring somebody else to do it. His job is going to get done. He'll use somebody else to bring deliverance because he's going to take care of his people. And me, I want to be one. I, I want to be one of those called ones. I want to be that. I want to do what I do. And you know what? If it's talking to the people at the grocery store, <laughs> which I do, <laughs> I don't care. I'm called no matter where I go. We all are. We're all called to do this. Now, Mordecai presented a pretty strong uh, case, didn't he? He said, you can, you, can, uh, you can avoid this if you want to, but you're not going to avoid it altogether. You could be the savior of, of, of a nation, but you're not going to avoid because that call, that edict had already been made. It was going to happen. Esther said, okay, gather up all the Jews in the city, fast and pray for me. If I perish, I perish. Now, once she decided she was all in, that's commitment. Recognize the gift, recognize the opportunity to use that gift and the challenge, and then own it. Esther was given a huge assignment to spare the lives of an entire nation of people, but she was also given the opportunity. She could have said, no, I won't do this, but she took ownership, and the result was phenomenal. It was. We're in that day and time now in our own nation that each one of us have a big job to do. It's as big as the one Esther pulled off there, Esther and Mordecai. And you may say, well, what can I do? I'm just one little old bitty person. Well, I would say plenty. Mm -hmm. You got a mouth, don't you? You got a voice. Right. You got a mind. Mm -hmm. You got the Holy Ghost in you. Yeah. You got the blood of your life. You got the unchangeable truth of the word sown into your heart, right? <laughs> you got the precious Holy Ghost, and you got the authority mm -hmm. of the name of Jesus to use it all. Yeah. Praise yeah. God. Isn't that yeah. awesome? Mm -hmm. We can do plenty. Yeah. One little person. In a, in, a, in, a, in a room can accomplish much. Yeah. Praise God. You may say this, and I said this at the beginning. Sometimes I say the end of my message at the very beginning. Y'all catch it. You hear me long enough. You may say, but it's God who raises up kings and priests and legions. Well, it's the last thing I wrote. <laughs> it's right here in the front of my brain. You may say, but, but it's God who raises up kings and leaders. And I would say, let me show you something. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. We are the body of Christ in this earth, and we are his shoulders in the body. That's how God sets up government, is through his people. And you will give a vo uh, an account for your voice and even your vote. Can you play that back right there? It's about the authority that we walk in. So it's time to arise and to pick up your rod. We come with the authority of the rod of heaven. We come in the authority of the name that is above all names. His name is Jesus. We come in boldness. We come without fear. We come in the perfect love that casts out fear. We come not in anger or anxiety. We come in peace and strength and love. We come with kingdom authority that overrules and swallows up every other authority.
I get authority and take my place in the kingdom. Praise God. That's who we are. Hallelujah. Esther took up the righteous cause. She put on her royal apparel. Apparel. Now I believe when she entered into that court, the king's court, I think she had a revelation. She literally carried the name of the king. She was his wife. She was his queen. She had his name, his favor, and his attention. And this man was absolutely in love with her. When the king saw Esther, he extended that golden scepter to her. And he offered her up to half of his kingdom before she ever opened her mouth. That's right. That's right. Now, this was a man in love. Yeah. And he was in love with his queen. Now, who do you think we are? <laughs> who do you think we are before mighty God? We, when we were received Jesus, we walked right through his blood. Yes, we did. And Jesus introduced us to the Father. And when the Father looks at us, He sees the blood. Amen. He loves us every bit as much as the one who hung on the cross. Mm -hmm. Because He did it for us. Right. Now, Esther walked in there. I think she had a revelation finally of who she was. And He was in love with her. Because I tell you what, when we pray, <clears throat> we can tell God what we want. But when we're in the glory... When we're in the presence of the king, he always asks us, what can I do for you? Mm -hmm. And that's what this king did. Esther, what do you need? I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. Just tell me what you need. She had walked into the glory right there when she walked into that court. Now, Esther started her plan, invited the king and Haman to come to her banquet. The plan was made. Obedience to rise up and save a nation. The plan was now activated to stand for the righteous cause to prevent the evil and to put a stop to Amalek's plot to destroy God's people. Now we know the end of that story. We know the whole end of that story in that banquet. Esther exposed Haman's plot. But what I think is so awesome in all of this is that this king restored the royalty back to Mordecai and Esther and handed Haman and his entire bloodline. It was 175,000 people in that town, in that bloodline. And, got, and that king gave them basically the same assignment that God had given to Saul 600 years before. He restored them back to their royalty and gave them the permission to protect themselves and to take vengeance on the very enemy who wanted to destroy them. Mm -hmm. Now that, to me, I have heard of Esther my entire life. Mm -hmm. But when I read this story, I had just not seen this in that story. And that's what God has made us. Mm -hmm. We are kings and priests. Mm -hmm. We're a holy nation. A royal priesthood. And we're the called out ones from the earth. We're not here to destroy anything but the evil. Everyone that has a choice can make that choice. But when evil comes against us, we have every right to put on our robe and walk into the presence of the king. Knowing, knowing that we have his name, and he's absolutely in love with us. He's really happy to see it. <laughs> and at that point, we've entered into the glory. And that's when he says, we don't even have to ask him for anything. We thank him for all that he's done. And he says, what can I do for you? I think it's such a beautiful picture of what we have. What we have in Christ Jesus. Now, we know the end of that story, don't we? Amen. The same gallows that Haman built for the Jews ended up being for him. I think Mordecai represents the Holy Ghost in this story. 
He heard new things that Esther had no way of knowing. He taught her. He advised her. He led her. He protected her. He, al he alerted her. And he gave her the plan as to how to overcome it. They were descendants of King, King Saul. God restored both of them to their places of royalty. Haman ended up being destroyed just like what Saul should have done 600 um, years earlier. I remember that one day, uh, about a year ago, there were several things coming against me, and um, it was a situation I was going to have to handle. I couldn't get around it. It had to be dealt with, and I knew it. And I had put it off. I had begged God. I had asked him to do it. I asked him to send angels to do it. I didn't <laughs> want to do it. <laughs> I did not want to face that situation. And I knew I was going to have to. It wasn't going away. It was not going to go away. And I was in my office one day, and I was just crying. I was crying. I was begging. And listen, I'm a word of faith one. <laughs> I know better than to beg God. But I was begging him that day. And I was saying, Lord, please, please just take care of this for me. And uh, this is what I heard in my spirit. And I said, I said, Lord, help me. Just, just help me. You said you'd help me. And uh, what came up in my spirit, he said, I have helped you. I have helped you. I've strengthened you. And even now, I'm upholding you with my own right hand. Now, I need you to help me. You have to go fight the righteous cause in this situation. You know what's right. So do they. You're going to have to go in there and handle this thing. You're going to have to deal with this thing. You're going to have to face it head on. I have helped you. He said, I've given you re redemption by my blood. I've given you the unchangeable truth of my word. I've given you the power and authority of my name to even use all of that. Now you go and do what you're called to do. You stepped up into this place of the anointing. Now use it. And, and that, that's what he said. And as bad as that shook me up, it empowered me. It empowered me, and I was able then to face that situation and handle it and take care of it. And that's basically what Mordecai was saying to uh, Esther. <laughs> You're here for a reason, sister. Get in there and do your job. <laughs> now, our job is to cry out to God. Our job is to stand and speak the word of God. Pray over this nation. Pray over these elections. No matter how they turn out, pray over this nation. We, we need help. We have to, when stuff like that's going on in New York City, we need help. And then the kids in the schools are wrong. If, if they want to mention Jesus, we need help. And just like what happened in the other story, when we do this, the angels will come and get involved with us. They will help us, and they'll cause it to be. We have God's righteousness, which has gone before us, and his glory is our rear guard. That's the Holy Ghost. We're co-laborers with God. Just think about that. He needs mankind to speak and obey his word in the earth. And as we speak, we're sowing his word into the earth. I've got one more video, and it's about four minutes long. Would y'all take a minute to watch that? Would you play this last one? And by the time, if you're questioning who you are in Christ, I want you to listen to this man, this is Mr. Graham Cook. I want you to listen to what he says. There is a difference between our state and our standing. Our state is often how we see ourselves outside of Christ. And we see ourselves often as weak, powerless, incapable, or in the case of the ten spies who went with Joshua and Caleb, they saw themselves as grasshoppers. The enemy gets you convinced by situations and circumstances that you can't win this battle, you can't fight this thing because he's bigger than you, stronger than you, and you're just not tough enough or strong enough, and really, you're just like a grasshopper. And then we take on that whole persona. And we, were, we saw the giants and we felt like grasshoppers in our own sight. That means what they saw turned their thinking into a negative place that was so destructive they couldn't actually inherit the promises of God. There's a battle going on, guys. And we need the language of God. So we see ourselves in our state. We don't see ourselves in our standing. Your standing is... Who are you really in your placement in Jesus? What are you portraying? Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Your standing is who you are in Jesus. Your confession of all that God wants to be for you and all that God wants to do for you. <clears throat> so your standing is 
that you're a new creation. You're a people for His possession. You're a royal priesthood. You're alive to God. All grace abounds towards you. All sufficiency is in you through Him. You're anointed. You're the apple of God's eye. As He is, so are we in this earth. You're baptized into one spirit. You're baptized into Christ and His death. You're being perfected. You are the beloved. You are blameless. You're blessed. You're blessed with all spiritual blessings. You've got bold access to the throne of God. You're as bold as a lion because you're born again. You're part of the bride. You're buried with Christ in His death. You can do all things in Christ. You're chosen. You're a chosen generation. Christ indwells you with all His fullness. You're a co-heir with Christ. You're created for good words. You're curse-free. You're dead to sin. You're dead with Christ. You're declared holy. You're a disciple. You're elect. You're enriched. Everything works in your favor. You're enriched in all knowledge. You're faithful. You're a fellow citizen. You're free. You're free from sin. He's freely given you all things. You're a friend of Christ. You're fruitful. You're gifted. You're given all things. You're the habitation of God. You have the mind of Christ. He's at work in you. He is for you, not against you. You're healed. You're hidden in Christ. You're highly favored. You are His body. You are His fullness. You are His possession. You are His workmanship. You are a holy nation. You're a holy priesthood. You're increasing in the knowledge of God. You're inseparable from the love of God. You're a jewel in His eye. You're a joint heir with Jesus. You're justified. The kingdom of God is within you. You're a king. You're a priest. You're a ruler. You're known by Him. You're lacking in nothing. You're the light of the world. You're living by faith. You live by God's Word. You're a living stone. You're made in His image. You're made rich in everything. You're more than a conqueror. You're a new creation. You're a sound mind. You are ordained. You are a different people. You're the people of God. You're the pillars of God. You are prepared for good works. You are protected, purified, raised with Christ in resurrection life. You are redeemed. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. You're a royal priesthood. You're a saint. You're the salt of the earth. You're sanctified. You're saved. You're sealed. You're seated with Him in heavenly places. You're a servant of God. You share His authority. You're the sheep of His pasture. You're a shining star. You're a son of God. You're a son of light. You're a steward of the mysteries. You're strengthened by Him. You are the elect of God. You are the friends of God. You are the fullness of life and godliness all belong to you. You are the righteousness of God. You are the temple of God. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are transformed. You're a vessel of glory. You're a vessel of honor. You walk by faith. You walk in newness of life. You are a warrior. You are, the, you are the wise. You are witnesses. And you are absolutely worthy of the Lord. righteousness of God. Mm -hmm. You have made me go, go over everything that you can remember. I, I'll send you the links to all of these all of these if you want them. Yeah. No weapon formed against me is going to prosper. Mm -hmm. Tiny tongue rises up against me. Oh, we just call it right down. Mm -hmm. I'm everything he's called me to be. He's blessed me exceeding abundantly above all I can ever even ask or think. Mm -hmm. By the time you do that and you go into him with that kind of worship and praise, you will not have a petition. You won't have a petition at all. You'll wonder why you even went in there. You'll just be glad you, just be glad you did. <laughs> there, there won't be any prayers or petitions. You pray the prayer of thanksgiving, the prayer of thanks of what he's done in our lives and who he's made us, that there will be very few petitions that, that you'll even have. Praise God. Because you've entered into the glory. And that's when the glory asks you, what can I do for you? Praise God. That's my message tonight. That is my message. God took these two people who were in so much trouble and, and to the place of sheer extinction. Extin, extin, extinction. How do you say that? <laughs> they were going to be gone. They were going to be wiped off the face of this. The whole nation. <laughs> they were about to be wiped out. God 
God restored them to their place of royalty and gave them complete authority over the devil who was going to kill them. Yeah, Praise right. God. Now, when you think about this, you remember the three Hebrew children thrown into the fire? Mm -hmm. When they got into the fire, there evidently was a fourth man in there with them. Mm -hmm. Well, now, do you think the three Hebrew, Hebrew children saw that fourth man? Do you think they felt him? Do you think they saw him? The Bible simply records that the devil who threw him in the fire is the one that saw the fourth man. Mm -hmm. The devil who threw the three Hebrew, innocent Hebrew children into that fire is the one that peeked in there and saw four. But the Hebrew children had such a faithfulness and a commitment to their God. Mm -hmm. They were bound, and when they got out, the only thing that was burned off of them were that was, was the bondage. Mm -hmm. And it does not record anything at all about them seeing fourth man. Mm -hmm. But the king who threw them in there sure saw the fourth man mm -hmm. and became a believer. Mm -hmm. See, that's what we can do. That's what we can do. Just simply by our witness. Knowing who we are, being the called of God, going forth, recognizing what's going on in this earth, and standing against it. Pray for those people. Pray for the ones who are coming against us. But if they keep coming, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, <laughs> that's what you do. Just pull back and learn and shoot. <laughs> Praise God. Now that we know who we are in Christ, can we all just... Tonight, what I wanted, it is 839. If anybody needs to go, you're absolutely dismissed and, and, and welcome to leave. But I would like, I, I don't want to do the, the circle hand thing. I want everybody just to pray individually and just reach out to God. Don't want to lay hands on anybody tonight or anything like that. What I, we will if we need to. We will if we need to. Let me back that up. We will if we need to. Okay. But tonight, what I wanted was us just to pray for the great United States of America. We are, we, we are the city on a hill, mm -hmm. the shining light to all. That Statue of Liberty stands there and says, mm -hmm. we have what you need. Come on. And welcomes everybody in. But anything that is hovering, any evil thing that's coming and hovering over our nation, let's be one of the prayers. Let the angels get involved and fight that thing back. It's the only way it's going to be fought back is spiritually. Supernaturally. Right? right? Hallelujah. You glad you came? Amen. I'm glad you came. I'm glad I came. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're so glad you came too. Huh? I'm glad you came too. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm, glad. I'm glad I came. Huh? Can you say something? Yeah, Jesus. If you want to. It's okay? Yes. My son wants to say something. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at Jesus. He did dead the cross for you. The yeah, power of the name of God. Mm -hmm. And Jesus up in the up in the earth and the above except for you. The yeah, power of Jesus' name. Amen. Song back on there, and um, which one? Uh, the very, the, the very the one, that, yeah, the very one. That just, I, I think of you every time I hear it. Two men's song, uh, the revival. Ooh, can we just stand up? Or, or just, or just sit, just sit where you are. Get, get on your knees. Come to look. Well, this place has an altar. Walk around. Let's just take about five or ten.